my name is Dave Chandler. I'm the practice lead for Enterprise Networking Solution at Worldwide Technology. Uh, and we've been spending a fair amount of our time um, over the past two years looking into software-defined networking. How many people in the audience are familiar with the term software-defined networking? How many think they know what it really is? <laughs> yeah. So, so that's the problem. And what I'm going to do in this presentation is I'm going to go through, uh, you know, the first part of it's going to be very basic. It's going to be, why are we even thinking about it? You know, what is SDN? What is the market around SDN? What advantage do we have by changing what we've been doing for years and doing it very well from a networking perspective? So I'm going to go through that first, and then we're going to talk a little bit about where is SDN today? How has it changed from when it started back in 2008, when the term was first coined? How is it different today than it was back in 2008? And then what are we working on in Worldwide? What do we see as hey, we need to focus on this to really help our customers uh, understand this concept of SDN and put it to work in their networks rather than just seeing it as uh, a lot of opportunity for salespeople to come in and give you a bunch of marketing. So first of all, you, you're probably all aware of the, of the hype around SDN. You've seen it on the, on the blogs, you've seen it on the websites. Um, over the past two years, uh, you, see, you saw articles out there that said, um, it, it's really a farce. It's not going to do anything for us. It's not there yet. There's no value in it. And now you're seeing much more people saying, yes, we found the use cases around it. We're starting to use it. And there's going to be value of SDN inside of our networks. And we're very much at that point as well. And at the end of this, I'll show you the Gartner hype cycle that talks about, you know, here's the peak of expectations, which I think we were there sometime last spring, and how over the summer really went into the, the valley of delusion, where everybody was hyping SDN, but they weren't showing you any products that actually used SDN. But the, the hype was certainly out there. It started probably out uh, back in 2008, which is the first reference that I found to software-defined networking. Uh, probably two years ago, you saw a lot of the academic institutions really starting bring, bringing forward SDN as a way of, of achieving certain network topologies on their campuses and also, and probably more importantly, taking the, the value out of the hardware and putting it into software. So uh, translate that to, I can use much cheaper hardware and still have the same value than if I buy uh, an expensive box from somebody like Cisco or Juniper or whomever. So what is SDN really depends on who you are. If you talk to somebody from service provider, it looks like one thing. If you talk to someone from enterprise, it looks like another. If they're in data center, you get a definition of that. If they're in campus and branch, you get a definition of that. So what this slide basically shows, um, if you can't see it, it's a bunch of guys blindfolded touching an elephant, and they're all describing that elephant or that SDN thing as something different. Uh, <clears throat> so it also introduced a whole new bowl of tech soup. So if you look in here, you'll find um, terms like OpenFlow. Um, OpenFlow is a protocol, and it's one of the first SDN protocols that came out that really got a lot of attention from people who were doing this technology. Um, often confused with a technology called OpenStack. OpenStack has something to do with SDN, but it has more to do with server deployments in a cloud environment. But again, a lot of confusion there. Everybody thought that OpenStack was SDN and SDN was OpenStack. You see vendor terminologies in here like ACI. I think someone was talking to me and said, I've heard ACI about 50 times now, and I have no idea what ACI stands for. So you got a lot of vendors now starting to throw different things out there. Down at the bottom, VMware uses uh, something called NSX. I don't know if NSX means anything or stands for anything or not. Um, but you are seeing you know, application-oriented and overlays. So a lot of these are really descriptions or tools for what we believe what uh, SDN really is, is network programmability. So I use this story of, um, in 1992, I got into networking and I bought, I was telling people earlier, I bought the second Calpana switch on the market. 
And what was significant about that is everything before that was hubs. Now, a lot of you in the room, some of you are shaking your head, but some of them are saying, well, I have no idea what a hub is. Um, but when switches were Ethernet switches that were introduced, it really allowed us to start virtualizing networks to be more effective and cost effective by running multiple uh, VLANs on the same piece of hardware. A lot of us take that for granted right now. But nevertheless, in 1992, when I bought the switch, the way I would talk to it is I'd plug in a console cable or I would telnet to it and I would type in the command uh, to tell the port, tell the box what I wanted it to do. And then I would go to the next box and I would telnet to it or put a console cable on it and go through the same thing. And I would do this box after box after box. And it was okay as long as I had three or four boxes, but um, I was working in environments where there are hundreds of network devices out there. So how can I be very consistent in how I work with that box and how can I be consistent on how I program the box? And a lot of that means I shouldn't be doing it. There should be some robot or some program or some script doing that for me. So what SDN does is it is really a single point of control and configuration and reporting for a network of devices. And that is network programmability. To be able to interact with that box in a programmatic matter, manner rather than interacting it with individual command line entry. So if you get that concept and you go, you, know, you go back to all the things that are in that bowl there, ACI is essentially a system that contains a controller. ACI allows me to program a fabric from a single controller. If you look at OpenFlow, that is a protocol that talks from a controller down to a device. So even though you see a lot of different things in here, they're really a description more of the process of network programmability than SDN itself. So why do we even need SDN? What are the business drivers behind it? Okay, it makes it easier for me to do this programming, but that's really not a business driver. That's just a making it easier on the network guy sort of thing. So if we look at this, there's several drivers that have come into play over the past year, past couple of years that have really been key in driving this technology forward. Because if the business owners don't want it or need it, they're not necessarily gonna pay for it. So the first one is cloud. Um, cloud started out, and I would say, um, for those of you who've been in the data center business, you saw VMware come out with ESX somewhere back in uh, 2007 or so, 2006. It lived very much in the development or the DR space for a while because no one was going to trust their key application on a virtual machine. And for crying out loud, it's a virtual machine. So in 2008, you actually saw it come out of DR, come out of dev test, and start being used in a production environment. At that point, you saw cloud conceived and cloud uh, basically enabled and is used today uh, you know, very, very effectively, and the development time around cloud was very, very short. So within that, you, you now had not necessarily uh, cloud itself, but if you look at a virtualized environment, one of the key things that allowed me to do is to move a workload from point A to point B. So I have a virtual machine living on one server, and let's say I want to move it to another server. Now, why would you want to do that? Uh, here's a simple one. I have the physical machine that it's residing on. I want to add more memory to it. If I want to add more memory to it, I can move that workload over to another machine. As a matter of fact, I can evacuate all the workloads. I can then shut down that physical machine, put more memory in it, turn it back on, move all those workloads back onto the physical machine. So it's a very simple but a very cost-effective and very business-oriented reason for wanting that capability. So now I'm, I'm moving servers around and it's actually even happening automatically. If you look at its process like DRS and VMware, it will automatically load balance the workloads over multiple machines. So one of, the, one of the requirements of moving a workload from point A to point B using vMotion and VMware is it has to reside on the same layer two network. 
So how do I do that? How can I, how can I build my data center out so that I have the capability of moving a workload from one end of the data center to the other, and they're most likely in different layer two networks? So that's one of the sort of the problems, the business drivers there was uh, behind creating this whole SDN concept. The second one is video. I don't know about you, but I watch more videos than I read PDFs. Um, and there's two reasons for it. One is I don't need my glasses to watch a video. And the second one is I'm lazy and it's much easier to consume. And the third is I get a whole lot more information. I get sound, I get, I get example, and I can consume information much, much faster than if I read it. Now, everybody's getting the hang of this. So you look at YouTube, you look at um, even Facebook, uh, you look at things, uh, you know, up here we have, um, you know, things like Netflix. These things consume a huge amount of traffic on the internet now. It's estimated that 65% of the traffic going across the internet is video. So how do I deal with that? How do I deal with the QoS? How do I deal with um, providing somebody additional bandwidth if they want to watch, um, you know, basically a football game in high definition? How can, I, how can I be flexible enough to give him more bandwidth and for a cost so that he can watch that show for a particular period of time. Another driver is mobility. So I walk around with three mobile devices on me pretty much all the time. I have my phone, I have my tablet, I have my wireless computer. So how do you deal with now all of these devices, a huge proliferation of devices, how do I deal with them moving from place to place? So I was in North Carolina yesterday. I'm out in California today. I may be in St. Louis next week. How do you deal with that? How do you manage that? And, and you know, how do you control what's going on with that? And then another one that's, that's really interesting now is the sheer amount of traffic on the internet. So if you think about what we used to gauge bandwidth why, we would talk first about ter or terabytes, and then we talk about petabytes. Now we're talking about yottabytes. And so I have a question up here is, in terabytes, does anybody know how much a yottabyte is? A million. Order of magnitude or 10 oft. Okay. So, but since you hazard to guess, <laughs> I'll give you a cup of coffee. So you can, now in Cal, in North Carolina, this is five cups of coffee. In California, it's one. So. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so a, a terabyte, or I'm sorry, a yottabyte is a trillion terabytes. And it's estimated today that, and then this is probably six month old information, it was estimated last summer that there were between 14 and 16 yottabytes of storage attached to the internet today. And it's growing exponentially. So pretty soon we're gonna be looking for the next thing, and I don't know what it is, um, does anybody know what's past a yottabyte? But we're going to be looking for the next thing past a yottabyte, just because of the sheer amount of traffic on there. So once again, how do I manage all this? Uh, the traditional methods that we use today will very soon be insufficient to be able to handle that amount of traffic. So you also look at next generation networks and, and you look and talk to the businesses and say, what is it that you really want? And most of them say, I need to be able to be first to market. Now, I, I, I relate a story to this, and I use the example of Pet Rocks. OK, everybody remember Pet Rocks? Now, Pet Rocks came out before there was internet. Um, Pet Rocks were, what, advertised on television. But think about that, and I, and I always think about, if you're going to decide to, to, to sell Pet Rocks, you probably should be first. Okay, because sooner or later, people are going to find out that they're buying a rock and they're going to stop buying it. So how do I get to market first? How do I collect that, that initial enthusiasm about a product and be ready to dump it like a hot rock as soon as everybody realizes that it's really not worth anything? And, and that's really a good example of this of, is very, very rapid service enablement the ability to adapt to people wanting pet rocks or chia pets or whatever, and then be able to make those rapid changes without having that infrastructure stay there. So a lot of these products that you see, especially in the data center, are designed 
around, I'm going to go ahead and, and build my profiles and policies up front so I can use them very quickly and then tear down what I'm, uh, what I'm not using anymore. Another one is simplicity. When we start talking about the capability of rapid service enablement, we're not making things easier. As a matter of fact, we're probably making them a lot harder and we're probably making them a lot more complex. So how for the person that's going to be deploying this new service or this new network, how can I make it easier for them? So you can see I built this maze here and the maze is still there, the complexity is still there. How do I go around that? Because we, as we all know, simplicity is not simple and you really solve simplicity in a big way with automation. So automation goes back to, remember we talked about scripting and programmable networks. That's really where we're getting into the simplicity is writing the scripts that, yeah, they're hard to build the first time, but after they're built, I use them over and over again and I can use them very effectively and very quickly. And then finally, if you're gonna get someone to fund this stuff, you better have some business value to it. So can I monetize my network? Can I be first and get that, the money from that enthusiasm? If I'm a service provider, can I have someone swipe a credit card and so that they can have more bandwidth for three hours and then fall back to their previous levels? So I haven't really changed the infrastructure, but I'm making more money in that particular time frame simply because they want it. Okay, so there's, there's a lot of ways that you can go ahead and monetize this. And then the biggest one, of course, is, is cost savings. It, it's very hard to convince an IT department that a network is something that is going to make money for you. Everybody usually sees it as a cost center. So along with the, the monetizing and the business value of it, can it save you, your company money in the long run? So this is what we've been building to satisfy that right now. We're all, anybody who's in network engineering, how many people in here are network engineers or networking people? Okay, so you're probably familiar with this. We've all made Visio diagrams that look like this. You know, it's got switches, they're redundant, there's mobile links, I've got all kinds of protocols in here where they fail over. Um, the way I view it is this. We've built a bunch of stone hinges. They're fixed, they're stable, they're not very flexible. It's very sort of hard to move stone hinge around but it's been what we have been paid to build. And it's only the change in the business requirements that's driving us to do things differently than we did before. So let's talk, let's talk a little bit about of a comparison. If we go back to the data center and we go to the data center folks and say, okay, so what do you want from us? We want you to be able to keep up with the storage guys and the virtualization guys. You know what, because they figured it out They've gone from bare metal to virtualization to automation all the way out to cloud in a relatively short period of time. You look at AWS, you look at you know, all these services that are out there, they figured it out pretty quickly. How do we do a network and network services? Not so much. <laughs> so for those of you who don't know what CLI is, it's command line in, or interface, it's David sitting down typing in those commands to all the boxes out on the network. And at the end there, the only real advancement that we've made since I started networking in 1992 is that we've encrypted that CLI. So no one can tell what we're typing and sending to that box. But we really, if you think about it, we've gotten no further. 1992, there's David configuring his Kalpana switch. 2014, there's David configuring a, a Nexus 7000 exactly the same way. I didn't learn a darn thing, okay? So this is really where we need to move further. So the fact is, is no, no matter how advanced we've gotten in hardware, no matter how advanced we've gotten in our operating systems, where we, and I talk about the network community, is still behind in two things that really matter, agility and mobility. And that's what we really need to fix with, with um, software-defined networking. Now, for those of you who have been in networking, I pose a question. You have this concept now of Stonehenge, rock-solid, stable networks, and the new business need for agility are these oxymorons. Can you have something that is agile and something that's stable at the same time? And that's the trick. 
Okay, so let's talk a little bit about software-defined networking. So uh, the answer is, I don't know. <laughs> Yet to be seen. Um, you know, because if you think about it, if you're changing things, you're not going to be as stable as if it's in there. So there's going to be a balance between what is acceptable. It's, the way I look at it is when we used to talk on our landlines, if you're back doing TDM telephony back in the 90s, there used to be ads on, you know, pin drop. I can hear a pin drop, okay? The quality, the stability is so good that I can hear a pin drop. Now when you, now you, when you go and you listen to the cell phone commercials, it's can you hear me? Or this network has fewer dropped calls. So our standards for telephony have changed dramatically because of, of the business drivers. Are we going to have that same thing going on in, uh, in networking? And, and part of SDN, if you, if you drill down a little bit deeper into it, there's a process called DevOps. And that is really the process of developing your applications and your process and deploying them very quickly, accepting problems and errors and very, being able to correct them very quickly which is very different from what we do now where we wait for updates for major updates for operating systems. This is a constant rolling process. So I think that's going to change how we, what we consider stability. At this, I don't know if that answered your question or not. Um, so today's networks are defined by the box. So if you think about how we're networking today, we deploy a bunch of boxes out there. They all run their own operating systems, so they have separate policies. Um, there's distributed algorithms between those boxes. It's called spanning tree or OSPF or EIGRP. And they allow you to build these federated systems of independent boxes. And, and really it was derived from ARPANET back in the 80s. And ARPANET or the defense agency network that was built back in the 80s. And a lot of people, there's a great story, a lot of people like to tell the story, well, the reason they did that is it was during the Cold War, and if Washington got nuked, then we wanted to be able to still have things in Colorado working. And it's a great story, but it's not true. So the real reason behind that is, at the time, you think back to the 80s, for those of you who are old enough, circuits were highly unreliable, okay, as were the devices themselves. So what they wanted to do is if there was a circuit failure or if there was a failure of a device, they wanted the rest of the network to be able to survive. It really wasn't really around nuclear bombs at all. But, but that's how we built networks back then and that's how we build them today and that gives us the Stonehenge thing. So what we had, and there's not a laser on this, is there? But what we had typically was the control plane so I'm going to talk a little bit about control planes or controllers. The control plane or the brains of a device was directly attached to it. You could not separate that control plane from the forwarding plane, which was the switch or the router itself. So you ran an operating system. It was directly attached to that device. That device had the ports on it that actually forwarded the packets. You couldn't pull one away from the other. And so the path selection was done by the control plane individually on every box. Now, the early view of SDN, and remember if I go back, I talked about the academic um, world came out about uh, in 2008 and said, we want a better, cheaper way because we're tired of buying all these expensive boxes from the OEMs. And they said, we also want to be able to do research on networks without deploying multiple instances of networks. So a lot of your, your um, networking um, academic institutions are like Stanford and Wisconsin and Clemson. So they have campuses and they wanted to be able to say, I want to take a slice of this campus and I want to have it to be a research network where I can work on new protocols or new ways of doing things. But on the same devices, I still want to be able to run my production traffic, you know, David accessing the library or whatever. So another, um, so with a particular protocol that they came up with, uh, they were able to um, use a single controller, talk to multiple devices, and because they had a view of the entire network, they could create slices through the campus and give it over to the, to the uh, research group and still have production on the same box. 
So when people talk about um, open flow, that is actually one of the use cases for open flow is campus slicing. So they had a single control plane, so I had a single controller, and as you'll see later on, these are very often were open sourced based controllers. And they would use the OpenFlow protocol, which is a single southbound protocol, to talk to the OpenFlow enabled switches that were out there. So now I could you know, think of it as a global view of the whole campus. I could see end to end the devices in my campus and I could define the path of the packets through that or the flows through that network from one end to the other. And then I could create another virtual instance of that on the same box and have, a, have essentially a separate network going through there. So it, it, and then coming into the, uh, to the controller from the northbound, I had a common protocol. So the common pro protocol is HTML, or, uh, HTML5. So the whole idea here is I would talk in very general terms to the controller and the controller would then use through the northbound API and the controller would talk to the devices and give them specific commands through the southbound API. And I have a picture of this a little bit later on the slideshow that'll help with that a little bit. But it was, you know, it was the early view of it. I call it the purest view. It was very academically oriented view. Um, the OEMs were not involved at this point. Um, and you'll see a little bit later while that changed. So this is what it looked like. You had a control plane. Notice there's only one yellow circle now. And it had a, a basically the control traffic went down to the devices and told them how to forward packets and they would forward the packets. Now the current view is a little bit different. And if you think about that, if I were to go back to that, to that early view and say, okay, I wanna, I wanna deploy SDN. And I had a typical Cisco network. I would have to rip it all out, okay? And I would have to deploy boxes that supported OpenFlow. And I would have to find someone that knew how to program. And I would have to teach my operations people how to support this network. What's the likelihood of that happening? Like zero, okay? But, but still, in some academic institutes, there are parts of our networks that actually did that. So, if we, go, if we modify that a little bit, we come up with a pretty good story. So let's keep that a controller, because a controller is a good thing, because it allows me to see the entire network. And let's keep that common protocol coming in northbound. Let's keep using HTML5. It's well known. It's easy. And let's change it by having now multiple southbound protocols. So how, what do I mean by southbound protocol? Well, OpenFlow is a, a, a new protocol that allows a controller to define and you know to program a box to define the the paths what are some other ones well cli remember cli cli was me typing in but what if the controller typed those commands in it's a southbound protocol and it can still talk to all of those boxes down below it and i'm just talking to the in through the northbound protocol to the controller how about snmp it's something that if you're in networking, you should probably know that simple network management protocol. If you're into service provider, what about something called NetConf? Again, it's been around for years and years. And what if vendors like Cisco and Juniper and, and others wanted to say, I'm, I have APIs or application programming interfaces that are specific to Cisco or Juniper or Brocade, and I want to use those mechanisms to have the controller talk to that box, simply because I can expose features of my box that are maybe not available through uh, CLI or some other mechanisms. So what I end up with now is essentially a controller that accepts a single common language coming in from me, the programmer, or from the application that's driving it, but can talk multiple languages down to the boxes that are underneath of it, and more importantly, I can talk languages that my current boxes already understand, so I don't have to rip out my network. So you can see where this one came from. It came from the vendors. Okay? So they created a consortium called Open Daylight. And they said, you know what, this open flow thing is a great idea. This controller thing is a great idea. But we need to broaden that so people can still use the products that we've sold them for years and years. 
Okay, so I'll go through a little bit more about open daylight later on. But let's talk about separation of control plane and forwarding plane. So one of the basic tenets of SDN is the ability to take the brains of a device and move it into a controller so that the box itself doesn't contain the programming aspect of it, just the forwarding aspect of it. Is this new? And the answer is no. Uh, anybody in the room, uh, an old IBM mainframe guy? There's usually, yeah, that could tell back there. So there's always one, okay? And there's always at least one. So if you look at that and you, and you talk about um, SDL, SDLC in IBM mainframe networks, you had this notion of a controller and endpoints. So essentially that is a separation of the control plane where you're putting that up into the primary controllers and you're having the secondaries be slaves. If you look at a technology called performance routing, once again, I have a head-end device that is managing the devices that reside outside of it or underneath of it. How many people are wireless guys here? Yeah, the wireless guy is just going, I don't get it. We've been doing this for years. So when wireless first came out, you got an access point like you had at your home. They were, every one of them was autonomous. Now listen to this story because it's going to sound familiar. You would take that device, you would go ahead and put it out into the network. You would telnet into that device. You would configure it with the SSID and whatever, and whatever security you were doing it, and then you would move on to the next box. And very quickly, the wireless guys figured out, boy, this is a really stupid way of doing this. Why don't we have all the control or all the access points be slaves and have a single controller and, and just talk to that controller and have it manage all of the APs? So if you go down, but the wireless LAN controller technology has been around for what, five, six, seven years? So they're all looking like, well, you, know, you, you electrical guys probably now just finally figured it out that this is a pretty good idea. So it's not a new concept. It's been around for, for quite a while. So if we talk about um, what's going on in the controller world, so I'm going to go back to open source technologies right now. And then we'll talk also about some of what some of the vendors are bringing into the market as well. So back to the academic days, they're all about open source, they're all about free. So they, were, they would have projects out there where people would contribute code to an SDN controller, and probably one of the most popular ones out there today is called Floodlight. So Floodlight is an SDN controller, it happens to be an open flow controller, but you can go out to a number of the Open Network Foundation and you can download a copy of it, you can install it on a machine and you can run it and if you have OpenFlow enabled devices you can build yourself a software defined network. Okay? Um, but the problem, problem with this one is it only handles OpenFlow. Now we use a similar device inside of Worldwide and I'll show you one of the projects we're working. So it's not like this is, you know, forget about this, you'll never use it. It actually does have a place for certain applications. I talked about when the vendors got involved with SDN. Remember the academic guys are saying, all right, it's all about open flow. The vendors are saying, hey, wait a minute. Um, our customers want to be involved with this too, but they don't want to replace everything. So the vendors started some, a, a basically a consortium that they called Open Daylight. And in Open Daylight, the vendors and individuals could contribute code to a controller that they called an Open Daylight controller. And the Open Daylight controller involved those multiple southbound APIs, and they involved the, the vendor-specific APIs inside of that code. So you can go out and you can download an open source Open Daylight controller, and now you have those capabilities as well. Now also, and I, and I sort of moved the slide just for the sake of time, but also the, ev just about every vendor out there, every OEM that's in networking now has an SDN controller. So if you look at Cisco, um, I, I was doing demonstrations on ACI, which has what's called an APIC controller. If you look at VMware, their controller in NSX is it's actually derived from a NICERA controller, which was an acquisition that VMware made. Uh, Brocade has a controller. HP has a controller. Um, Viata has a controller. I mean, just about anybody who's doing SDN has their own controller. Why not use open source? 
because most of them are going to add value to the standard open source controller. So these controllers are not the same. They usually add features to it that differentiate their product from either the open source, open source stuff or other vendors' products. So there's something out there that I refer to as controller wars. So you now every vendor is going to have controllers that really enhance their products. Yeah, they're still going to, ha to ha have some of the standard stuff into them. They sort of have to. But they're not going to necessarily be able to do everything you want. So I still think there's a long way to go in, in how controllers are built, especially between the different vendors that are out on the market today. So going back and looking at controllers again, um, the green box up here represents the controller. So this is Open Daylight, or it's uh, Floodlight, or it's uh, Cisco's APIC EM, whatever you want to call it. Northbound of that, remember the northbound APIs. Is, uh, all right, so people are falling asleep. So what I'll do is let them listen to music. What's the, what's the common northbound API? What protocol? Yep, there you go. Someone was listening, so it's always, it's always nice. Um, so anyway, through the HTML, to HTML, I can talk northbound to a cloud orchestration device, or I can talk northbound to an SDN application. I have a guy on my team who writes Python scripts, and so he can build a web page, and he can, I can put in very simple information and hit submit, and he will take that information, put it into some pre-made script, and dump it down to a switch and configure it. Okay, so you can do that with an SDN application. And then there's also other applications out there as well. Uh, again, in the, just as an example, in the, in the ACI demo that I was doing, I was using UCS Director as an orchestrator. And UCS Director was giving workflow to the APIC controller, which was then pushing down that configuration to the hardware devices underneath. So all of that process up there is using HTML5 as that northbound API. Underneath the controller, you see the southbound controllers, which is basically the control plane of the devices that are in the network. And the conversation with them is OpenFlow, vendor-specific APIs, or CLI. Okay? And if you look to the left, you sort of see how they lay out. You have an application layer, you have a control layer, and you have an infrastructure layer. So hopefully this gives you a little bit of an idea of when you hear controller, you know where it sits, and you know that it is the declarative, you can speak declaratively to it, and you'll hear the word declarative, and that basically means I'm going to give it an intent, and it's up to the controller to figure out how to actually do it on all the devices that are underneath of it. <clears throat> Um, so other SDN controllers that are out there, I already mentioned Daylight. Uh, there's another one out there called Knox. And to be quite honest with you, this slide shouldn't have been in there. Um, more on the northbound uh, protocols. And you, you will get a, a copy, if you would like to have it, you have a copy of these slides. So it will have more than what I'm showing you here. Um, there's a whole lot more in the deck that's around um, other things besides SDN, network virtualization, virtualized network. And we'll talk a little bit about network overlays here as well. Uh, the southbound ape, you know, protocols are, are here too. But if you put all them together, so if you put together the strict separation, meaning the open flow concept that came from academia, you add to it the, uh, the, um, essentially the application APIs and other southbound protocols, and then also network overlays, which we're going to talk about here in a minute, that really constitutes the definition of SDN. All of those are programmatic methods that you use to create a software-defined network. So I'm going to stop there real quick. Any questions? No questions? Comments? OK. So let's go on a little bit. Um, I wanted to talk about overlay networks because you hear a lot about them, especially in the data center. So what's an overlay network? An overlay network is a logical network that you build on top of a physical network. Okay, so we'll go through what that is in a little bit. 
So here's your underway network. Remember, we're talking about overlays and underlays. You typically see these today in the data center. ACI uses overlay networks. NSX uses overlay networks. Just about any data center SDN application out there today is going to use an overlay network to solve that layer two boundary or layer three boundary issue that's out there today. Okay? So you, you typically have here, um, on the, you have the different subnets, you have a router in the middle. It's a typical layer three network. Um, the network segments are isolated by layer three, meaning they're on different subnets. So remember that VMware thing? I can't move a virtual machine from subnet A to subnet B because they're on dif different networks. So if I take that underlay network and I want to build an overlay on top of that, how do I go about doing that? Well, the first thing I do is I install virtual switches. Where are those virtual switches? They reside inside of the hypervisor. So the hypervisor is the VMware ESX host. And inside of every ESX host, there's going to be a virtual switch. And attached to that virtual switch are the virtual machines. Those are the blue and orange things sitting up top. So now I've created, at this point, um, an extension of that underlay network up into the virtual machines. But have I solved my problem with contiguous or, or having everything on this be on a, on a layer two network? No, I haven't. So how do I go about doing that? Well, the first thing I do is come in and put in a controller. Remember a controller? So the controller is going to have a control plane connection to all those virtual switches. Now the data path does not go through the controller, it's just controlling the switches themselves. And using a protocol um, such as, well, I'll, I'll, let me finish that. The controller abstracts the underlay network into a logical network. And what I mean by an abstract is it presents it to you as a network, even though it is doing things to um, use the underlay network as the actual connectivity. It's showing you a virtual image of what, you ne what your network, what do you want it to be in the function that you want to have. And how do you do that? Well, you use an encapsulation protocol such as VXLAN. And so what we're doing is we're taking the original packet, we're putting inside of another packet, we're sending it down through the underlay network, back up into the virtual network on the other side, and de-encapsulating it. So probably the simplest analogy that I have to this is writing a letter. So if I write a letter, and I'm standing in the same room as somebody, I'll write the letter and I'll hand it to them. That's communication across a layer two network. They're right there, I know where they are. I may say, hey, this is for you, so I just broadcasted, here you go. What if I'm in North Carolina and I want to send a, a, a letter back here to California? Well, what I do is I write that letter, I put it inside of an envelope, I just encapsulated it, I drop it into a mailbox, it's now going across the US mail underlay from North Carolina over to California it then goes to where it needs to be delivered, where the person opens the envelope or de-encapsulate, takes the letter out and read it. Okay? So that's a very simple example of encapsulation from point A to point B. I just put the letter in the envelope and put the address in it. I didn't have to know how it was going to get from California to, to Cal uh, from North Carolina to California. All that I knew is I just had to put that address and send it. So VXLAN is an encapsulation protocol that takes packets that are made in North Carolina, encapsulates them, sends them to, to Carolina, I'm sorry, to California, and then de-encapsulates it in California. So if you think of it like that. So what, it, what would it look like? So here's the network that I want to have, and the red, the red dashes here is the actual path that it's taking. So that you can see the encapsulation point is on the left for traffic going east to west, so to speak and it's de-encapsulated on the other device and, and delivered to the VM on the other side. And because the network thinks it has that yellow path, I can now do that V-motion from the network on the left across essentially a layer three network to the network on the right. Make sense? 
Okay, so a couple more things. I'm running short on time here is you'll also hear another term out there that's called network function virtualization, which is essentially an add-on or a follow-on to software-defined networking. So if you think about it, if I virtualize a network, if I take um, uh, physical networks and I put them into a virtual construct, what about the services? What about the firewall? What about the load balancer? What about the IPS? Can I embed that into a network as well and manage it through a controller at the same time? And the, the people who are very much into NFV are service providers. Because I'm hearing more and more again about what service providers are doing to deploy services out there to their customers. What they used to do was go out to APC or whoever, get a rack, put a router in it, put a load balancer in it, put a firewall in it, put a UPS in it, bundle it all up, ship it out to the customer site. Okay, They would then have a technician go out, cable everything up, and turn it on and configure it. Okay. Now what service providers are talking about doing, talking, is sending a server to the site. And on that server, I'm going to have a hypervisor. And in that hypervisor, I'm going to have virtual Im images of a router, virtual images of a load balancer, virtual images of a firewall. And when I plug that server in, it's going to call home. It's going to get an IP address off of DHCP. It's already programmed to go to some site where it's identified by like a MAC address and says, oh, well, that's David Chandler's business. Go ahead and configure the router in this way, configure the firewall in this way, configure the load balancer in this way, and I'm done. So network function virtualization is taking a lot of that functionality that used to be done in hardware and embedding it into a virtual instance or in a virtual uh, without an appliance. I'm embedding it into the network. So a couple of, of key players in startups. I'll let you read that later on. And so I come down to what is, an, what is really the definition of SDN? And SDN essentially is a flexible, it has to be. It's programmatic and it's a framework because I want to use, remember soup? I want to use a lot of those different tools and techniques that allows me to optimize the delivery and management of a network. And it's really driven by, in many cases, business requirements of hyperscale growth and data center, in operational costs and complexity, and, and then also the different delivery models that we have today. So you, you know, a whole other topic to talk about is, if I'm sitting out at a branch site, how is what I'm doing different than what I did even two years ago? So now, instead of everything being in my data center, I'm going to Salesforce. I'm going to WebEx. I'm going to all these different places where it used to be in a data center. Now it's a cloud app somewhere. So how do I have to adapt my network to handle those? So remember, I, I promised you the hype curve. So last year at this time, I think we were at the peak of inflated expectations. And I think really now we're, we're coming into the slope of enlightenment. Um, I, I know for us at Worldwide, we have said, okay, we're talking about this SDN stuff. How do we use it internally? It's one thing for me to come in here and, and blather on with a bunch of PowerPoint slides. It's another thing to say, hey, what? Guess what? We've tried it. We found an application for it. And we're, we're dealing with some of the, of the new struggles that we're going to have with SDN. So the state of SDN is really something you buy versus something you build. Uh, people say, well, well, you know, how do you do SDN? Well, you go out and buy it. Okay, if you don't have programmers, if you don't have people that can build you interfaces, if you don't have people that know enough about networking to program to those specific functions of the devices, go out and buy it. Okay, go to Cisco, go to VMware, go to, you know, wherever and buy this stuff. Um, what you will find is even though you do buy it, you can then come back and integrate it with a lot of other systems within your network. Or if you do want to write code, you talk to that controller, you talk to that northbound API with the program. So there's very few places that I've gone and talked to that has the wherewithal of doing programming for SDN. There are certainly some. Most people are going to go out and buy SDN technologies from an, from an OEM. 
So what are we doing? We've done a ton of workshops on SDN. Um, I've probably given you know, this presentation, which usually is stretched out into a four hour period, which puts lots of people to sleep. Um, but, but we've done this over the past two years. You know, that number says 65. We're probably a good 10 or 15 above that right now. And mostly because people don't understand what SDN is. And it's, again, there's been so much hype about it, there's been very little definition around it. Um, another thing that we've been doing with, within our company, and we have, oh, by the way, if you go out to our website, there's a, what we call a use case document. Um, so as we go around to different customers and they say, well, how, how can we use SDN? We collect them and write them down and say, here's some use cases. Some are very technical. You know, it's like, how do you black hole packets in a router? Okay, that's one use case. Um, probably a bigger, a better use case is something like this where we have monitor manager. So what we mean by monitor manager is I can use an, a, here's where we get into open flow. I can use an open flow switch as essentially a very flexible span device. So I can span ports not only can I span ports, but I can span individual protocol types out to specific ports connected to monitoring devices. So in this particular example here, we have, for example, traffic that's being, um, I'm spanning off HTML traffic and, and ICMP traffic to two different devices so that I can separate those protocols and separate those applications and monitor them independently. So I'm basically slicing out, <clears throat> excuse me, the flow from that application and sending it, send it to a specific monitoring device. Now you can do this with Gigamons and Anui boxes and so forth, but an open flow switch and an open flow controller is way cheaper than any of them and does very much the same sort of thing. So this is absolutely an application for open flow and an application that people can use today and do use today inside of their networks. One thing that, and, and I'll, I'll, um, I'll end on this one. Um, the other thing is, is <clears throat> you've probably heard about our ATC lab. How many were at the thing this morning? Okay, for, for those of you, anybody who is not a WWT employee, can you tell me what ATC stands for? There you go. I'm required to ask that question and reward it, by the way. So, <laughs> so in the, yeah. I helped design it. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. You did a great job. So inside of the ATC, we do a number of different things. We, it's it's 5,000 square foot raised floor space. None of it is running production applications for worldwide technology. It's designed as demo space, development space, proof of concept, lab as a service. So inside of this environment, we, ch we change things very, very rapidly. A customer comes in, wants a particular topology for a, a proof of concept. He's done in a week or two. Someone else comes in, they want a different topology. Lab as a service says, I need to build this infrastructure up very quickly, run these tests and be able to tear it back down and reuse the equipment. So in order to do that, we've gone out and and we purchased a, a product called Quala Systems, which was really just a test automation software. But it also does something interesting, is I can build topologies inside of Quala Systems, and literally with the push of a button and the use of a layer one switch, I can deploy that topology in a matter of minutes rather than a matter of days. So that's a great thing. But as we got bigger and bigger, what we realized is those layer one switches are about a half a million dollars, okay? So they're, for me to go back to my boss and say, hey, you know, I proposed this and it's working great. I need four more of these half million dollar switches. You know, and he basically laughs as he's signing my pink slip. So, so what we thought is this would be a great use for uh, an SDN use case for us. So remember OpenFlow again? One of the things that another use case for it is across the back plane of an open flow enabled switch, I can map one port coming in the front to another. So it literally passes through all the traffic, which is not usually a function that you have in an ethernet switch. It's filtering and rebroadcasting and do all kinds of other things. So what we did is we worked with Quali to build a driver very similar to the one for the layer one switch except for an open flow controller. 
And in this case, since we had it, we used Cisco's XNC controller. And it's talking to top of rack switches. That's at the top of every rack, obviously, the top of every rack inside of our data center. So when we get a device, we put it in the rack, we cable it up to what we call the matrix, which is that, that uh, now layer one switch or open flow enabled switch. All of those switches are cabled back to our core layer one switch. And so now what we can do is when we want to deploy a topology, we go into Qualys Systems, we design the network like you would with Visio, we then push a button and Qualys Systems drivers talk to the layer one switch and they talk to the controller and it goes ahead and makes all of those backplane connections so it looks like a port in one device is directly connected to another. But I've done it in three minutes. Okay, so now we can do what's called lab interleaving. So I can run a lab, a topology, I can bring up a topology, I can run it for three hours, I can then tear it down, use that same gear to build another topology in three minutes, and then I can tear that down and bring the original one back and put it in place in three minutes. So now it allows us, instead of someone reserving gear for weeks at a time, we just say, okay, really, if you're just gonna work on it on, on in the mornings, we'll give it to you in the mornings, but someone else is gonna use it in the afternoon. It's a change in mindset for a lot of people, but again, the Qualys Systems also is not just does the port mapping, but it also does the automation, so it allows me to, to save and reinstantiate the configurations that were on there before. But that's our use case for software-defined networking. And it, it was not as easy as the way I just made it sound. So we had a lot of our pain points, vendors interoperating with each other, um, getting a buy-in from management that this will save us money and it will work, okay? Um, and then also um, being able to figure out what happens when you run this at scale. So we did our due diligence, we did a POC, we did a pilot, we put it into production and it broke. How often does that happen? Now the reason being is we went from a POC of just saying can we do it to a pilot, we did it in a couple racks, now we're doing it on 88 racks. And suddenly there's a big, much bigger scale issue. So you will run into those things and you work through them and you know, it's just a new technology. But it is a great use case for us for software defined networking. If you're a network engineer and you wanna be in this business in three years, learn Python because uh, the new job description for network engineering will include uh, scripting capabilities. So I'm um, at the end of my time a little bit over. Any questions, uh, comments? Yes, sir. Okay, so the, the question is about VMware and Cisco, and there are two camps, you betcha there are, and they're called VMware and Cisco, okay? Um, so uh, VMware and Cisco used, and, I, and, I, and I'll, I'll be real honest right now, I worked for Cisco for 12 years, but during that time we were really, really good friends with the VMware, so I don't quite get this. Um, VMware and Cisco both want uh, to, to be a dominant force in the data center. VMware acquired NICERA, and NICERA was a controller um, you know, that was really, at the time, aimed more at service provider, but they figured they could use it as enterprise as well. NSX is a very good product. It does you know, things that ACI can't do. However, it is limited entirely to a VMware environment. So if you have bare metal servers, or if you have bare metal appliances like load balancers or firewalls, they are not involved with NSX at all. NSX also, and a lot of their sales guys and the engineers know better, will tell you that I can deploy NSX on top of any underlay and I don't have to worry about it, okay? And obviously if you've ever been in, in the world of networking at all, you know that that's not true. Cisco's ACI is really a more holistic view. So it manages both virtual and physical devices. The, the, the issue that a lot of people have problems with with ACI is it requires you to buy new hardware. Okay, so 
what, what's really interesting is when we go and talk to customers, and, I, and I'll be real honest here, the, the VMware guys or the VMware salesmen will go talk to the virtual administrators. And it's a no-brainer to sell NSX to the virtual VMware administrators. The network guys go, yeah, that's great, but what about the 80% of the physical devices that are in the data center? What do I do about that? And the VMware guys will say, that's your problem, because we're the virtual guys. So I, I really think that customers are going to demand that both of these products work together. Right now, the, the marketing of VMware and the marketing of Cisco is if you have us, you don't need them. And I really don't believe that's true. So there are two different camps. Um, when the salesmen come in and, and talk to you about it, you're going to get two very, very different stories. Um, we're actually doing some interesting things around running the two of them together. Uh, but we haven't gotten far enough down the evaluation phase to tell you anything about how that's working or what are the advantages or the disadvantages. All that we've done to this point is get it working. Okay? I don't know that I answered your question or not, but yes, there's two camps. Both of them are data center SDN products. NSX is VMware, yeah, NSX is VMware only. ACI is the whole data center. NSX says, I don't care what the underlay is. Cisco says, if you want to run ACI, you've got to buy Nexus 9000 boxes. Okay? Other questions? So what do you see orchestration um, coming into the picture? Do you see that as taking off? Uh, I, I see orchestration as essential. Um, one of the problems that you have with, with any of these products is even though they're going to tell you how simple they make things, it's very complex. And even with, in, with both of the GUIs, both VMware and with, with uh, ACI, to sit there and use the GUI that comes with them and do the configuration and the management is very labor intensive. If I can put an orchestrator on top of it, and I really don't care what it is, if I can put an orchestrator on top of that to mask that you know, with workflows, then it's going to make these things much, much easier to use and it make the adoption rate uh, much higher. Now, we do at Worldwide, we do have NSX in the lab. We do have ACI in the lab. We do workshops on both. With ACI, if you're interested in that, we have what we call one day test drive. We will come out to a region. We can do 16 people at a time. They don't all have to be from the same company. But you can sit down and spend a day and go through ACI and actually see how it works and what it does. Other questions? That answer your question? Okay. okay, well, thank you very much. Don't forget to do the text poll.